It's such a thrill to be with you guys. How are you? Just want to honor your pastor, Pastor Joe. He's been a good friend of mine for quite a few years now, and he loves this church. He loves you guys. He talks to me about you all the time. And uh, should I talk about those people that upset you the other day? But, oh, no, no, no. That, 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 there's none of them here. They're all at the Warner location. Don't worry. Um, it's so great to see you. What an awesome, amazing sense of God in the room. It's incredible. I think uh, Pastor Joe and Yovana are doing an awesome job. And uh, it's an incredible thrill to be friends with them and to be ministering in this sacred desk this morning. Also want to honour your pastors, Pastor Mark and Nina. They've been good friends and mentors of mine for a long time, about 15 years. And at every major junction in life when I've had decisions to make, those guys have really been incredibly kind and wise with their feedback to us. And so, uh, yeah, if if, if anyone wants to know, they're pretty good people. They're pretty good people. Just in case you and I haven't met before, my name's Ben Tifi. I spent the last seven years pastoring a church in Alice Springs in the Northern Territory with my wife and my three daughters. Uh, I'm going to give you a little picture of my family just so you know people actually trust me with stuff around here. Um, So I think we've got a photo of me and my girls up on the screen there. Now over here, this is my wife, Dania. Oh, I don't know where that photo came from. I think that was the security camera in the the elevator somewhere. Um, Tomorrow... Danielle and I celebrate our 24th wedding anniversary. And that's pretty cool. And she graciously, graciously uh, wanted to get rid of me somewhere. So she rang Emerge Church and said, look, can you get him to preach on the anniversary weekend? I'd rather get my nails done or something. So she's, she's got rid of me for the weekend up here, which is pretty cool to be with the buffaloes yesterday. And then you good people this morning. 24 years of marriage. She's an incredible lady. Everyone likes me better when they know her. These are my three daughters. Um, as you can tell, we have we've just did our last photo shoot in the desert because um, just a, literally just a couple of months ago, we uh, took on a new role as the senior pastors of Encounter Church in the north of Adelaide in a little town called Gawler. And uh, so we're not Northern Territories and Territorians anymore. We're in a new place. But I'm so new, I'm still using the GPS to get to Woolies. And also, I've like only just moved to South Australia. So people keep going, where are you from? And I'm like, is it legit for me to say like I'm from South Australia? I've only been there a few weeks, you know. So it's sort of like, well, I'm kind of from the Northern Territory, but not anymore, you know. So I don't know where I'm from. Do you know where I'm from? If you have an answer, please give it to me. But these are my beautiful daughters. India is 20 years old. Molly is 18 years old. And Lily is 15 years old. India, uh, I had breakfast with her yesterday because she lives in Brisbane, the trader. And uh, she... (laughs) She is now on staff in the church that I got saved in. And in fact, the church that before we moved to Alice Springs, I was the campus pastor of a church in Bowen Hills Hope Center. And uh, my daughter, she's now on team there doing ministry. After 20 years, it's like, I would have thought being my daughter would cure you of ministry, kid. But no, she's just, it's ruined her entire life. And now she's doing ministry as well. So that's pretty cool. Couldn't be more thrilled and happy with her. And God has been so good to us. here's, here's, um, Here's my new album cover for my rap album I'm about to release. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't written any songs yet, but at least I've got a co- I've cover. You know, at least I've got the cover, so that's good. This, these are my kids when they were young. This is a photo of them from uh, all of their baby years and all that sort of stuff. Do I have that? Maybe. I, maybe I, oh, there it is. Yeah, I know. So over here, th- this is the day I brought India home from hospital. Wow. 8.5 pounds 52 centimeter little fatso she was Um, and look at me hey who would trust that face with a kid I mean I couldn't other than an indoor plant I'd never kept anything alive at that point in time and look I've still got hope in my eyes it's incredible the fool had no idea what I was getting myself in for that face has no idea that it's about to lose sleep for seven straight years how good is that and here's the other two we love cooking and all that sort of stuff now my children you can get rid of that photo, guys. Thanks. Um, my, my girls have grown up in a house where they've never seen their mum thrown through a wall, never seen their mother punched in the face and sworn at. They've never been afraid and had to hide under the bed from their father that was on a rampage. That's the house my girls grew up in. The house I grew up in was racked with violence. Wow. I, by the time I was 10 years old, I drank myself to sleep from 10 years old till 22 years old. Wow. I, by the time I was a teenager, I was smoking weed. I was a young adult, I was snorting cocaine and going out partying for three days in a row, getting, getting up and then, and then getting, going, going low and bombing myself out with booze to go to sleep. And I did that until I was in my mid-twenties. And I did it not because I was a rebel, not because I wanted to party, although I was partying a lot. I tell you what I did, I did it because I was depressed and I was traumatised and I was completely in pain all the time. And whenever I was sober, I wanted to be dead. 
after two years of marriage to my beautiful wife. She went for a walk on the beach with my mum one day and she said, I don't know what's going on with this guy. He comes home drunk. He's been out partying. I haven't seen him for three days and he stumbles in drunk and then he sleeps for three days and he wakes up and he goes back out and drinks again for three nights in a row. Then he rocks up to work and somehow makes it work at work and then he goes straight from work to the pub and then straight from pub he comes home, has a share and then goes back to work again. She couldn't do it anymore and she's just talking to mum and mum said, honey, just take all the money out of the bank account and start a new life. This guy's no good for you. And she came and she said to me, oh, I'm going to give you one chance. I had a talk with your mum. I'm going to give you one chance to change. And if you want to fix this, I'll stay. But if you don't, I'm gone. And I did something I'd never done in my life before. I told her what was going on. Wow. Sweetie, I'm not a rebel. I don't want to party. I'm not cheating. I, it's just that when I'm sober, I wish I was dead. I'm always anxious, I'm always panicking, I'm always in pain. And the only thing that goes through my head 24-7 is, God, if you're real, please let me get hit by a bus today. My life was just trauma and pain and anxiety. And the only time I had peace was if I was knocked myself out on drugs or booze of some description. She sat back on her heels. I'd never told anyone in my life what was really going on. I had a successful career managing businesses and consulting as a sales trainer. And um, no one would have known on the outside what was really going on because I was self-medicating so heavily that I could just pull it together for business hours. Wow. And then afterwards, I would fall apart. Even to talk to my wife in the morning, I'd have a couple of shots of Bacardi rum, which I hid in a cupboard above the coffee machine. Every morning, just so I had the emotional bandwidth to actually sustain a conversation with somebody. My wife rocked back on her heels and she said, I can't believe what a mess this is. I said, she said, why haven't you ever told anyone? I said, honey, if anybody knew what was really going on with me, they would never give me the time of day. And truly, when I looked in the mirror, I saw someone unlovable, unworthy and shameful. And I thought, man, I, I don't even deserve the oxygen I steal from the universe every day. She looked back and she said, I think only God could help you. I said, babe, God doesn't help people like me. You think I haven't prayed for 20 years for God to run me over by a bus, put me out of my misery? She prevailed upon me and we drove one hour north. We were living at the Gold Coast at the time. We drove one hour north to Brisbane, went to a church called Glad Tidings in Fortitude Valley. Only because the man who was the kids pastor in that church at the time was the former Mr. Queensland bodybuilding title holder. <laughs> Weird mixture. He didn't, don't worry, he didn't rock up to kids' church with his baby oil, you know. So like, you see, he was fully dressed. Um, but he was the only guy I knew that was, that was a churchy type person. And he'd taken on the role in that church as a kid's pastor. I was like, that's kind of weird, but anyway, whatever, whatever floats your boat, Mr. Queensland. And, um, but I knew, well, he's a good guy and he's into this church, so why don't we go to his church? So we walked in and I had an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed my life. And for the last 22 years, I've been walking with Jesus every day. My sister at the time, she said to me, Ben, you are just smoking way too much weed. You've got to back off. I said to her, it would be a miracle if I could go a day without it. Well, I'm here to tell you, friends, 22 years of miracles, <laughs> walking sober. And I didn't do it because I was good, because I was lost and stuck in a deep pit of despair, the gravitational pull of addiction. And there's not a word of criticism from me for you if you've been wrestling with stuff in this room. Come on. I have failed harder, stuffed up more, and been lower than most of the people I know. But I do know this. God comes into our lives not because we're good, but he is. And God offers us life in Jesus Christ. So whatever you're going through today, let me encourage you. The most important step might not be a long jump for you. It might just be your next step, your next step, your next step, your next step. You know, for my first few years of, of discipleship, I was an absolute mess. You know, Joe knows me. He probably thinks I'm still a mess. <laughs> I, I really wanted a long jump. Like, God, change everything now. God, make all my problems better. God, fix everything now. But God didn't do long jump. But boy, he did marathon. Oh, it's been a marathon, maybe. He, he did, step by step by step by step. And tell you a secret, every day I look at those photos of my kids. Every day. The grown-up ones and the baby ones. And I say, 
Look what the Lord did with someone so broken. And how sweet is God? How good is it to have a life rebuilt? How good is it to have, you know, the old building bulldozed and a new one slowly put in its place? Successive renovation over time. It's 20 years worth of it. So wherever you are, maybe you haven't taken any steps. Oh, I hope today you don't leave this place. Just take your next step in God. Yeah. Just take it. Don't leave this place without a quality decision. I'm just going to take my next step. Yeah. Even if you've never done it before, if you're not a churchy type, if you're not a God type of person, truth is sometimes it's easy to come to church and feel like you're a kind of like two left feet at a dance contest. You know, um, be very welcome here. Yeah. Be very welcome here. Yeah. There's hope for you. There's a better future than what you've got now. Yeah. And it, it'll be better if you involve God. Yeah. Take a leaf out of Bozo's book here. You know, I should have yeah. turned my life around and given it to Jesus a lot earlier than I did. Yeah. I just didn't know. Yeah. Well, I pray today you will leave here going, now I know. Yeah. Have you been a Christian for a little bit longer? Hey, your next step's important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's still a marathon, not a campsite. I mean, enjoy the view every now and then, but then remember, there's still a next step, okay? Okay? You know, like with a marathon, you don't pitch a tent, you just pack a snack, okay? You, you, have, your, you have your Eche bag. Do we have Eches in Moray Field? Is that right? You have, oh, don't, dob in, don't dob in an Eche. That's what our hotline's for, okay? I don't know if he's a real Eche. Have you got a bag? You're a real Eche. All right, bruv. Good on you, bruv. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> don't victimise the Eshes. My new area, Gawler, has uh, quite a large Eshe population, so uh, you can teach me some of your secret code language later, mate. <laughs> Listen, take your next step. You know, pack your snack, enjoy the view by all means, and be glad, take a breather, take a rest, but take your next step. That's really important, okay? We're going to open God's Word together this morning. Been with the men, gee, I loved being with the fellas yesterday. You know, I've got three daughters, a wife, a mum, and three sisters. That really means I've got eight mothers. So it was so merciful to be amongst the blokes yesterday. Thanks for busting me out, Pastor Joe. I appreciate that. And we were talking about this. I think I've got a slide. Wake up the mighty men. But now I want to say this. Wake up the mighty men and women. Okay, women, you get to be mighty men as well. All right. I mean, it's 2023. You can get to be whatever you want. But, but you can be mighty men. Now, listen, don't be offended if you're a lady in the place. Don't be offended about being called a mighty man. I have to be the bride of Christ. If I can be the bride of Christ, you can be a mighty man, okay? To the person next to you, give them a fist bump and say, wake up, mighty man. Now, this is important, okay? In Hebrew... In Hebrew, um, the word for mighty or, or valor, which is used, let's say, in the Gideon story. God appears to Gideon, who's hiding and is a coward. And God says to him, come on, mighty man. Hi, mighty warrior. Okay, and God uses the Hebrew word chayil, which means mighty or man of valor. Okay. Now, there's one other place in Scripture where that's used. And you women probably know the Scripture in its English translation, but you've probably barely heard the meaning of the Hebrew word. How many women have ever carried the pressure to be a Proverbs 31 woman? You know, that unattainable mirage in the desert. That annoying girl at your high school reunion that can do everything. <laughs> in, in most English translations of Proverbs 31, it says, a noble wife who can find, or a woman of virtue who can find. You know, the Hebrew word in Proverbs 31 is a woman of chayil. So a virtuous wife or a noble wife, it's okay, she probably is. But what she really is, is she's a woman of valor. Because in all of the Old Testament passages that talk about a mighty warrior or a mighty man, it uses the Hebrew word chayil. And we don't go, well, he's a noble man or a man of virtue. We understand it's a warrior metaphor. And the cool thing about Proverbs 31, she ain't no Susie Homebaker, baby. She's a warrior woman. She's a chayil woman. She, she's a woman of valor. She's... She's ready to get it on. She's going to take care of business. What does that mean here? It's not... There's a couple of ladies over there. And they were laughing about that. So wake up the mighty men. 
In Judges chapter 3, there's an incredible story. It's a very weird story. You're not really supposed to talk about it in church, but they didn't stone me in Redcliffe where we just came from. So they chased me away, but they didn't stone me. So I figured it would be safe to read that story together today. Now it comes with a an age and a language warning. That is, there's some weird stuff in here, but don't shoot me. I didn't write the Bible. Judges chapter 3 from verse 12. We're going to meet a mighty man. We're going to meet a mighty man who God uses in a mighty way, and we're going to reflect on a couple of things and say, how is God's word speaking to us in our next steps? Is that okay if we do that? Are you all right? Let's turn to the person next to you and go, okay, take a breather. We're going to open the Bible now. It's fine. It's fine. Judges chapter 3 from verse 12. It's the story of Ehud. Ehud, if you haven't ever read it before, you're in for a bit of a ride. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. And getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites and the Vegemites and the Marmites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. As long as my middle daughter Molly has been alive, they were enslaved. The city of Palms is known famously by another name. The city of Palms is its secondary name. Its primary name is the city of Jericho. Jericho has a famous place in biblical history because, of course, it's there that the people of Israel marched around in silence until God said, bring a shout. And they gave a shout of faith and they gave a shout of praise. The the worshippers blew a trumpet and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. It was a trophy in the cabinet of God. It was a testament to faith. It was a testament to just take in your steps. Literally, they stepped all the way around the city. It was a testament to what happens when step by step, step by step, you do what God says. And if you do what God says, then you raise your voice at the right time in the right way. When God says the walls come a tumbling down. Jericho was a trophy in the cabinet of God's people. It was their very best testimony. The first city they conquered. But now the Moabites have it. It's been handed over. And why? Because they did what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, backstory, that's code in the book of Judges for idolatry. God brought them into the land and gave them the land on the auspices. I have a covenant with you. And as I'm the land over, if you're in covenant with me, I will give you the land. But when they moved into Canaan, the Canaanites worshipped this god Baal. In Hebrew you say Baal, Baal. And he is represented by a bull. And they represent this bull calf. It was a problem in the wilderness, right? Moses up the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. They're down here going, wow, let's worship a bull. I mean, there's a bunch of bull in these stories. (laughs) They worship this Canaanite storm god, fertility god. And so God gives them what they want. And by the way, God does that. He doesn't force you. He doesn't make you be holy. He doesn't make you follow him. Mm. Yep. Usually what he'll do is he'll hand you over to what your heart deeply yearns for. Yeah. And actually what you're qualified, this is the sum total of your character. This is the sum total of your morals. This is the sum total of what's really inside you. Here it is. What you most long for, yearn for, and desire after. That's what shapes your character. Neuroscientists tell us, you actually are what you repeatedly give focused attention to. Well, the Israelites give their repeated worship and allegiance to the bull god Baal. So God hands them over to the Moabites, to the king Eglon, the Moabite ruler. In Hebrew, Eglon means bull. They worshipped the bull. They got what their hearts desired. Oh, bully God, come and rule over us. Okay. But are you sure you want what you're asking for? I mean, that's a good question for a human, isn't it? You know, when it comes to like, what do I really want? What do I chase? What do I pursue in life? What do I focus on? What do I give my allegiance to? Which that's all worship is. Worship is saying, you're my king. That's what worship is. We lift our hands. It's a sign of surrender, exposing the vulnerable parts of the body. It's ancient battlefield language. You're now my king. I surrender to you. Well, if you worship the bull, God will give you an Eglon. What the what the the direction of the needle of the compass in your heart, whatever that points to, God will bring it into your life. And we become like what we worship. That's why Isaiah said you've got to be careful what you worship. You worship these these gods that are deaf and dumb and blind, and now you're spiritually deaf and dumb and blind. 
You become like what you worship. And Israel got what they wanted. They worshipped the bull. So God said, okay, fine, I will remove my hand of protection. You can have the bull God if you want it. And they are enslaved to Moab, to King Eglon, for 18 years. Well, look at verse 15. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They got sick of it. They finally went to the right source. God, deliver us. And God gave them a deliverer. By the way, this is not part of today's sermon, but here's the, this is the way scripture works. People are enslaved. They finally wake up and cry out to God and God gives them a deliverer. God gave them a deliverer. Who is he? Listen to this. Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjamite. Okay, pause button. Group therapy time. <laughs> How many fellow lefties are in the room? Let me see ya. I can tell they have a crazy look in their eye. <laughs> I'm a, look, there's actually a lot of lefties. Are you a lefty? Are you? Yeah, right. Yeah, you raised your right hand, so it's like <laughs> channeling Beyonce. Um, lefties, you know, my granddad sent me to Bunnings once to get a left-handed screwdriver. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have them in stock. <laughs> and they also didn't have the indicator fluid that he wanted for his car as well, but that, I don't know. Lefties, lefties, you know coffee cups, they don't make right-handed, they don't make left-handed coffee cups. And, 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 and in school, as us lefties know, when we write in the book, we go home with ink smudged all over our hands, unless you do it the weird way this lady is, which is like a weird, are you a yoga grandmaster or something? That's weird how you can do that. <laughs> you, you go and you smudge all your work. You righties will never know, you'll never know. You will never know what we've been through, righties. And you just write in your carefree fashion. Not a smudge to be seen on your page or your hand. Because notebooks favour the right-handed. Us lefties, we have to learn Hebrew because Hebrew was written right to left. So we can, when we do it, we can do, we can do that too. <laughs> I'm a left-hander. I've been left-hander my whole life. I get persecuted for being left-hander. I get called names about being left-hander. For instance, if I go surfing or skateboarding, and you righties, you, you do it this way. And that's just normal. But I'm a lefty and I do it this way. And I get called goofy-footed. <laughs> that is an unkind name. My, my feet are very similar to yours. <laughs> Same number of toes for the most part in the room. <laughs> Lefties, we're, per we're, we're persecuted. Well, it's one thing to have a you know, mild misfortune. And all the lefties know what I'm saying in the house. You know. It's one thing to have mild misfortune, but in Israel to be left-handed. Actually, if you read this text in its original ancient language, so we conveniently have an English translation, which is great, but it was written originally in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, there's no phrase for left-handed. So how you say left-handed is you say restricted in the right hand. <laughs> it's a very polite euphemism, which you often find in Scripture. It says something mean, but kind of a nice way. You know, like Kelly from work. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. Oh, it says something mean in a nice way. He, he was restricted in the right hand. Barry Webb, he's a famous commentator on uh, the Old Testament. He's written a very landmark commentary on the book of Judges. And he makes the comment in this section that restricted in the use of the right hand hints at a disability. Now, of course, it's not like today. Like today, we want everyone to have access. And so we understand, man, sometimes you need, you need special access. You need, you need us to help you. You need um, a, a car park that's closer to the entrance if your mobility is restricted. Maybe the bathrooms have to be set up so they're easier and safer for you so that it's a better experience and you're not in danger of falling over. You know, all these sorts of things. We just do that without even thinking in our society now, right? Not like that in Israel. In Israel, they, it wasn't accessible. It wasn't equitable. In Israel, the belief was if, if you have a, a disability... You must deserve it. And God knows there's something wrong with you. All the gods, all the universe. They, it know, the universe knows there's something wrong with you. No, none of us know, but the universe knows. And because there's something wrong with you, that's why there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and they believe that your physical abilities were a commentary on your value and worth and your spiritual morality. So to have a disability is to be innately suspect and outcast. A man restricted in his right hand could have been crippled, twisted, 
could have been completely limp, could have, could have been chopped off. We don't know. It doesn't say. All we know is Ehud has a disability. Now, Ehud's from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Benjamin. When I'm in trouble, Benjamin! Oh, my blood pressure still gets up when I hear someone say that. Benjamin. In Hebrew, it, it means um, son of my right hand. <laughs> Ehud is from the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of the right hand is... He's restricted in his use of his right hand. He's a left-handed guy in a right-handed tribe. <laughs> the Benjamites were famous for archery. I don't know if you've got any archers in the room, but you kind of need two hands to do archery. Not Ehud. He's not a warrior. He's disabled. He's unlikely. But when we're introduced to Ehud, we're not told, oh, there's this guy that everybody would have pushed aside. There's this guy everybody thought something was wrong with. There's this guy that nobody trusted. There's this guy, the left-hander in the right-handed world, we're told. But God gave them a deliverer. His name was Ehud. Oh, pally, 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 old friend. You are who God says you are. You are what God says you are. You're not what your circumstances tell you. I know it feels like it, but see, this is the thing that a wise person in God understands. I'm not what my circumstances say. I'm not what they say. I'm not what my tribe say. I'm who God says I am. That's why I can get off booze. That's why I can get off drugs. That's why I can recover from trauma. That's why I can say the joy of the Lord is my strength because I'm who God says I am. Praise God that I had an awakening that I am not my biography, but I have a new one. I am I am a new creation in Christ Jesus and I am who God says I am. Yeah. And so are you. You are. You can hoot and holler about that if you want to. You're who God says you are. Everyone else sees a left-hander, a man restricted in his right hand. God sees a deliverer and Ehud walks down the street. He is confident. You might think I'm disabled, but I'm a man of God. Wow, he, he is. He. Dropping soon, dropping soon. It's coming in my album. It's called The Anthem of Ehud. Okay, we're going to go quick. <laughs> The Israelites sent him with tribute to King Eglon, king of Moab. So every year, the Israelites are enslaved. So they get all their money, all their possessions, the product of their labor, the fruit of their fields, the, 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 the profit they've generated from trade. And do they bank it? No. Do they keep it? No. Do they pass it on to their kids? No. They send it to King Eglon. And they're colonized by this foreign power. And once a year, they have to make a payment. The payment is bribery. We won't kill you all if you give us cash. These stories often end badly, these tribute ceremonies in the ancient world. Because if the king doesn't like what you've dished up, off with your head. Maybe poor old Ehud delivered the tribute the previous year and lost an arm. We don't know. All we know is if you're going to send tribute to the king, you should be in fear and trembling of your life. And old Ehud gets served up. The Israelites send Ehud. Old Ehud, he's not a threat. Old Ehud, who really cares what happens to him? He's expendable. Ehud's not that big a deal. Okay, we'll send him. The king won't worry. They won't be suspicious of him. But at the same time, if the king chops his head off, we've lost nothing. So they sent him. He presents the tribute to King Eglon, who was a very fat man. Thank you, Scripture. <laughs> Verse 18, after Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon. Listen to this. He said, your majesty, I have a secret message for you. Well, I skipped a verse, which is important, so I'm going to go back. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. And he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjamite. 
The Israelites sent him with tribute, to, with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Listen to this. Now, Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. A cubit is the tip of your elbow to your wrist bone. That's what a cubit is. So he's got a sword. He's made himself a double-edged sword that, that long for him, strapped to his right thigh, under his clothes, he's got a secret weapon. A secret weapon. He goes and he delivers the tribute to the king. And he leaves. And he gets to the stone images, the idols that the Israelites had set up. And he thinks, yeah, this is the time. So he turns around and he goes back to the king. Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. Verse, nearly verse 20. The king said to his attendants, leave us. And they all left. And Ehud then approached him. While he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace. And he said, I have a message from God for you. And as the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade. And in case you weren't already squeamish, the author of the sacred text writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gives us this particular life-giving text and his bowels discharged. Short on dietary fibre. Nothing like a knife in the guts to get things moving, is there? Ehud didn't pull the sword out and the fat closed in over it. And then Ehud went out to the porch and he shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And after he'd gone, the servants came and they found the doors of the upper room locked. And they said, hey, I mean, we've already heard that the, the gates of heaven opened, the floodgates opened, right? They're standing outside the locked door. Oh, they say, he, he must be relieving himself. He must be relieving himself in the lock room of the palace. And they waited to the point of embarrassment. And when he didn't open the doors, I mean, you know, at what point do you, go, do you knock on the door? Hey, mate. Are you okay in there? <laughs> and they opened the door. And there they saw their Lord fallen to the floor dead. And while they waited, Eod got away. And he passed by the stone images and he escaped to Seira. And when he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. And so they followed him down and they took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. And they allowed no one to cross over. And at that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. And that day, Moab was made subject to Israel. And the land had peace for 80 years. That is a weird story. There are some incredible weird details in that story. Good luck at family dinner this Wednesday making sense of it all. All right, let me give you a couple of questions. We've got, to, got a slide here. First of all, who would really find Ehud a threat? A threat? Who would find, disabled Ehud, everybody would look at him and say, there's nothing he can do, he'll never be anything, he'll never go anywhere, look at him. Where did Ehud, a one-armed man, learn to forge a sword? He made himself a two-edged sword, Scripture says. Where did he learn how to do that? You don't understand what forging is. You go, you get a bunch of metal, you heat it up really red hot in the fire, you hold it on an anvil, and you clank it and you bang it and you bang it, clank, 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 and you work it 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 until it takes shape. You keep working. You keep hammering it out. And as you hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer and there's heat and heat and you turn up the heat and you work and you pump the bellows and you come back and you hammer and you hammer and you hammer, eventually you end up with something that's just for you, custom made for you, tailor-made solution to your tailor-made problems. And where did one army who'd learn to do that? Oh, here's a, here's, a, here's a good question. 
Who helped him? Like, because how, how does a one-armed man hammer something? And who helps him get it in and out of the fire? And he must have had a band of brothers, I guess, a community, but here they are secretly forging something. Mm. Where did Ehud get the idea from? A man who's been told his whole life, you're nothing, you're no good, you're nobody, stay away, you'll never amount to anything. But his mind is open and receptive to a new, a brand new insight. How was he stirred to his new idea? Well, here's a question. Imagine how he could have failed. Well, Ehud, you only get one shot. You better practice a few times, Ehud. Practice hitching up your skirt, grabbing your sword and sticking in the king's guts. Most people would look at the king and say, who's too big to fight? Who's a fat man? Ehud says, well, he's too big to miss. And he draws his sword and he stabs. I wonder how many times he practiced. I wonder how many times he practiced grabbing the sword in just the right place. Imagine if he just borrowed someone else's sword on the way in the door. Mm. Hey, mate, can I borrow your sword? <laughs> well, it wouldn't have worked because he would have been unpracticed. Oh, he, he would have been untrained in the wielding of the blade. <laughs> and he would have fumbled. And Eglon is suspicious. Shh, get out. And we already know his attendants are all, they're, they're so attentively near the door that they know when maybe he's relieving himself. Okay? You get one shot. Oh, I hope you've practiced holding the sword, Ehud. I hope you're trained in the blade. The samurais have a saying that says, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. Training behind the scenes. That's what Ehud was doing. He was hammering out a solution in the secret place. He's hammering out a solution. He says two really weird things to the king. Hey, king, i got a secret for you. The king kicks out all the attendants. Then Ehud comes and he says, king, I've got a message from God for you. I mean, you know, bring that, bring that prophet to your next staff meeting, Joe. <laughs> I... In Hebrew, he says, hey, king, I've got a dabbar Allahim for you. I have a word of God for you. I, I, everyone thinks we're under slavery. Everyone thinks nothing can ever change. Everyone thinks there's no good to come of this. Everyone even thinks poor old Ehud, there's nothing he can do. But Ehud knows something no one else knows. Because day after day, friends, day after day, Ehud has fashioned himself a word from God. His mind has been open. His spirit has been attentive. He has gone to the secret place. He has turned up the fire. And there in the forge, day after day, day after day, him and God, him in prayer God is raising up a deliverer and as he forges something in the secret place it takes shape and he leaves that place ready to confront the king and what does he have no not a sword he has a word from God he has a word from God for the enemy he has a word from God to penetrate to the very depths of the situation Come on. oh king I have a word of God for you good jam There's one place in the Old Testament where the Word of God is called a sword. Mm, yep. Judges chapter 3. Come on. Oh King, I have something for you. It's a dabar alahim. It's a word of God. And the word of God topples the enemy. The word of God sets people free. The word of God sets nations free. But you see, you can't be unskilled in the word. You can't be untrained in the word. You can't be a newcomer to the word. In fact, there's a word from God for your very situation. It matches your hand. It'll strap to your thigh. It's under your clothing. Ehud walks around. No one knows. No one knows day after day at the forge, forged in the secret place. He has been fashioning this word. He's been fashioning an idea. He's been fashioning a wise reply. He's thought of a solution. God's mind has been communicated to him and he walks around and no one knows. You don't know what I've got under these clothes. 
You don't know what's been hammered out at the anvil of secrecy as I have gone to the God of Israel and said, God, deliver us. And God has raised up a deliverer. Everyone would think Ehud's just banging out a sword, but he knows I'm working on a word from God. The easiest bit for Ehud was stabbing the king. The real work was forging in the secret place. We know this really was a word from God. We know because here's a picture of the swords from the Bronze Age 2, which is when the book of Judges took place. Kofeshes, sickle swords. They don't have a very sharp point because they're not stabbing implements. Why? Because this is the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, metals are, weapons are made from bronze. Bronze is not good for stabbing because if you try to stab with bronze, it bends out of shape. So you make a sickle-shaped sword, which is a very strong shape, and then you sharpen the edge up on that sickle-shaped sword, and that is a hacking sword. And, and, and of course, why you need to hack is because people wear in body armour, and if you've got soft metals for making your swords, then when you try to stab, you're going to dull the point, and then you're ineffective. Or you're going to bend your sword, and I don't know about you, but if your sword's shaped like an S or an L or something, you're not a very good soldier. So you use a hacking edge instead of a thrusting edge. And you aim for bits where there's no armour, like here, or here, or here. And it's a hacking tool. All the archaeological data from the Bronze Age too shows us these are the type of swords all of the Israelites and the Canaanites and the Phoenicians were using at the time. Here's a picture for some double-edged swords. Double-edged swords come from the next period of history the Greeks and the Romans, the Iron Age. Military combat changed in the Iron Age because now we can make swords with iron and that's a strong, resilient metal. Now I can stab you with iron. I don't just have to hack. I can hack. I can hack from both sides. But I can now make a sharp point and I can stick that pointy end into the vital organs of your body to kill you in combat. That's how it works. Where did a one-armed man in the Bronze Age come up with the idea to make a sword no one in his history had ever seen before? And he calls it a word from God. A word from God will give you a solution no one's expected. A word from God will speak deeply to the heart of your situation and make the enemy lose stuff. A word from God. I'm glad the first time I walked into a church 22 years ago, the preacher had got in their prayer closet and secretly forged a word from God that when they took the pulpit, they delivered a word that struck straight to the heart of my situation. What they had forged in secret delivered me in public. I'm so glad that David learned to forge a word from God in the secret place. And as he was in the wilderness as an obscure shepherd boy, and no one even knew his name, but there he honed his prayer and his worship and his psalm writing abilities. And there he honed his ability to swing his sling and to protect his sheep against the lion and the bear. And he'd been forging, he'd been forging and talking to God in the secret place all those years. And then one day Israel faces national catastrophe. Goliath is challenging everybody, there's not a man to step up. And David says, I'll take him because I've been in the wilderness and I know my God, the God of Israel, and I'll come against him in that God's name. And I've been practicing with my sling against the lion and the bear and I can take this uncircumcised Philistine. I am so glad David knew how you forge a word in the secret place. I'm glad Moses knew what it meant to forge something in the secret place 40 years in the wilderness roaming around as a shepherd till he confronted the God of Israel face to face in the burning bush. And after that life-changing encounter, he went to Egypt with a life-changing word. Pharaoh, I have a word from God for you. Let my people go. 
And he went to the Israelites. God has a word from us. Come on, we're going. We're off to a new land, a new place, a new life in a new land. I've got a word from God and He's shown me in the wilderness. It was forged in the secret place and no one was expecting it. It was Jesus' habit. The gospel writers tell us all the time Jesus would sneak off as was his custom at night time and he would go and up a mountain and pray and seek the face of God. And all of Jesus' ministry was a public expose and what had been forged in the secret place. We get an insight into one of those sessions of Jesus in the workshop. Bang, clank, praying seeking God's face, worshipping, surrendering in the secret place, God in the garden of Gethsemane, knowing God is driving me to the cross. And he had one moment where he said, God, if there's any other way, God, if you could take this cup of suffering from me, let it be so. Yet not my will, but yours be done. That's how you fashion a word from God. You surrender your life, you surrender your will, and what you do in private ends up becoming something that blesses in public. Well, I'm glad Jesus learnt to forge in the secret place because I wouldn't be here, nor would you today without it. Time after time after time. As a family man confronting problems with my kids, problems with my wife, I don't have any you can see, they're all hers. I know what it's like to go to God and forge a word. God, speak to me about this child. Oh, my 14-year-old Lord, it seems like she's just going crazy at the moment, hormones and stuff and all weird stuff. What do I do? And then on my face in prayer, God gives me a wise insight. Talk to her about this. Oh, she just needs extra nurturing right now. Don't argue with her. Hug her and nurture her instead. I wouldn't be smart enough to come up with that, but I went and I hugged that 14-year-old and she suddenly became sane. I thought she wanted to argue about Tay-Tay's next concert tickets. <laughs> Only a word from God told me what she really craves is love and affection. And if you give it to her, it will soothe everything else that's going on. Praise God I learned to forge in the secret place. You know, all those nights in the first few years of being a believer, I mean, I got saved and, and God really came into my life and changed my heart. But some nights I'd lie awake and I would be overcome with temptation to drink myself back to sleep again. Overcome, I'm ashamed and embarrassed to tell you. I'd lie there, my wife asleep, thinking, God, you've done so much good in my life, but man, I'd kill for a drink or a smoke of some weed or something. I would be crippled with temptation. And all sorts of possible scenarios would begin to present themselves into my mind. And the only thing I could do is grab my doona and drag it out to the lounge room and spread it on the floor and get on my face before heaven and pray and forge, forge, forge a word from God in the secret place. God, I'm overcome with temptation right now, but I need your spirit. I'm feeling empty, but your word says you have been given fullness in Christ. Lord, I, I feel like I need something else, but your word says you will meet all my needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Come on, friends. We are who God says we are. We are what God says we are. And some of us need to get in our secret place and begin to pray and begin to hammer out with God's Word and begin to open our minds and our hearts to God's Spirit to say, God, you know, don't tell your friends all your problems all the time. Get on your face in the secret place and forge out a Word from God that will overthrow the enemy. Thank God I learnt to seek His face in the secret place. Little did I know that God would turn my story around and I can't tell you how many fellow junkies and depressed people and broken people and traumatized people. I've had the joy of leading to Jesus because I've simply just shared my story, but it's not the story as it was then. It's a story that spent years being hammered into a word from God. Now, it's not a tale of tragedy. It's not just a battle. It's now battle stripes. We could talk a lot about this word. And all I want to tell you, friend, is there's problems you're facing. But you're not the only one facing them. Others are too. Come on, get in the workshop. Turn up the heat. Hammer out a solution with God. Open your mind to, from heaven to new insights. And it only comes in prayer. The Apostle Paul meditated this story deeply, deeply. Because there's only one place in the Old Testament where the Word of God 
is called a sword, a double-edged sword. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul calls the whole church to its battle marching orders. Take your stand against the enemy. Oh yeah, by the way, he says, and just so you know, we don't actually fight flesh and blood, we fight spiritual powers. So like, no actually stabbing real people. You know, because we're Christian and stuff. So don't like, okay, stab guts, stab people's guts. Says, no. He says, we fight spiritual powers. So take up the full panoply in the Greek, the full set of God's weapons. It's translated in says the armor of God, but it's actually a word that means weapons. It is, includes the armor. Take up all the weapons of God. And it says, and, and the sword of the Spirit. And he uses the word for double-edged sword. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He's saying, you and me, wear hoods. And we've got to have something under our outfit. It's a word that can come out at the need time. But for us to deliver it, we've got to hammer it out. Pray. Get in God's word. Be encouraged. Can I pray for you? I'll hand back to Pastor Joe. Father, I pray for my friends in this room. I pray whatever their challenges, whatever their temptations, their doubts, their discouragements and their sh- stresses and their issues, I pray they'd be encouraged that your word would live in them. That they'd be encouraged to come to you and wrestle through in prayer and rest- wrestle in prayer, wrestle out a word, hammer a word from God that lives inside them closer that they can take out and use against the enemy in any occasion. Lord, speak to us, shape our lives by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for having me at your church, family.